afternoon, everyone, and um, welcome to today's webinar. I'm April Frederick, and I'm the Education Coordinator from the Manatee Observation and Education Center in Fort Pierce. And we are super... We're super happy to be hosting this program today, and I'm really glad to have you all joining us. I don't know how many of you might be familiar with the Manatee Center, so I just wanted to tell you a tiny bit about us um, before we get started. So we are an environmental education facility, and we're located right in downtown Fort Pierce. Um, and our goal at MOEC really is to um, promote understanding and responsible actions for the protection of the Treasure Coast ecosystems and ev really everything that lives here. So what you can do at our facility is come and visit us. Uh, we have aquariums and exhibits that focus on wildlife found in the Treasure Coast. We have a tide cold touch tank and other critters you can meet. Um, and of course, we have our manatee viewing area in the back of our facility where hopefully you can watch for manatees. But today, we're super excited to be hosting this webinar on sea turtle friendly beaches. It should be a really fun program. I'm super glad you guys all joined us for this. We're going to have uh, Ken Joelli presenting for us today. And then a little bit later on, um, Joe Scarola is going to be giving us some information and we're going to be talking to him a bit about um, sea turtle lighting. But um, before we get going, um, we just have a couple of little housekeeping things um, that we want to make sure that you guys are able to help us with. Um, so uh, one of the things that I wanted to point out um, is that this webinar actually is going to be available to you on demand after this live session. And Ken will be sending everyone a link to that afterwards so that you can watch it, share it with your friends, see it as many times as you want to. It's gonna be a really good educational program today. Um, one other thing we'd like to ask you guys to do is to please keep your mic muted um, throughout the entire presentation. And any questions that you have at all, um, you can actually type those right in down below with the little chat button that you see right down at the bottom of your screen. So please don't hesitate to ask us questions. Um, we definitely will have a good Q&A session um, towards the end of the presentation as well. So we hope that you enjoy this and we're going to go ahead and get started. I'd like to introduce you to our primary presenter, Ken Joelli. Ken is a natural resources extension agent for St. Lucie County. That's the University of Florida's IFAS program. And um, Ken is actually a local guy. He's a Fort Pierce Central High School graduate, which is super cool. Um, Ken also uh, took some classes at Indian River State College right here in St. Lucie County. Um, but he got his bachelor's degree from the University of Central Florida. And then he also has a master's degree in agricultural education from the University of Florida. So Ken is no is a lot of stuff. In addition to all of those things, these things I think are super cool. So he has a, a graduate certificate in environmental education from University of Florida. That really means that Ken knows what he's doing when it comes to environmental education. And he's also studied tropical biodiversity in a short course from um, the Organization for Tropical Studies. And he has worked extensively on sea turtle issues um, throughout his time with the University of Florida. So we are super lucky to have Ken uh, giving us this presentation today. And welcome, Ken, thank you for inviting us all to join you. Oh, thank you, April. And Joe will be on with us a little bit later on. Uh, Joe Scarola, you kind of see him. Uh, he's got the white background from Ecological Associates. I have had the fortune of working with the Manatee Center since before they were even open. So uh, working with April and Meredith and Rachel and all the wonderful people at the Manatee Center uh, has been really a treat uh, for several decades. We've actually educated a couple of generations of people here on the Treasure Coast. So I have a few terms that I want to go over. You might hear me use these terms during the presentation. So it's kind of like a simple vocabulary time right now to discuss. Plastron is the underside of the sea turtle shell. So at one point, I'm gonna talk about how the plastron on green sea turtles, in other words, the underside, 
is yellow. It's got a little yellow tint to it. When I talk about the carapace, that's the upper portion of the sea turtle's shell. And then if I use that term rack line, that's where the organic material and other debris is deposited at that high tide line. So when you're walking on the beach, you pretty much see that, that rack line. Uh, usually you see that rack line when you're walking around on the beach. So sea turtles, of course, are protected species. Here in Florida, all of our sea turtles are protected under the U.S. Endangered Species Act. They're either listed as threatened or endangered. The U.S. Fish and Wildlife is the agency that regulates those, uh, the EPA, uh, the, the Endangered Species Act. They regulate uh, those threatened and endangered species issues. And then at a Florida level, we have the Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission that regulates on a statewide level. So we've got the feds, then we've got the statewide level. Uh, I do have that phone number there. So if anybody sees any sort of wildlife violation, maybe somebody is doing something stupid like riding on a sea turtle, which is illegal, or harvesting eggs or whatever illegal things, you know, people do these things sometimes, unfortunately. There is a phone number that I have underneath the FWC um, uh, information right there. Then we also have county and municipalities that have their own code and their own enforcement uh, regimes. I am most familiar with St. Lucie County and the Treasure Coast, that's Martin, Indian River, St. Lucie, but we can have people on this webinar from well outside of the Treasure Coast. So in St. Lucie County, we have codes that run from March 1st through November 15th, but from what I understand, those, the sea turtle nesting season here is pretty much the longest in the state. Uh, those municipalities and counties that have their own ordinances, they might have it that's a little bit shorter. Maybe it ends in October 31st. What you can do is you can find out by going to the FWC website and just searching for sea turtle lighting codes, and you should be able to find the, the codes for your municipality or your county. And of course, it's up to each person to be responsible when you're on the beach. Try to leave it in the same condition that you find it in, if not a little bit better. Go out there and pick up trash when you can. Don't leave sandcastles and pits and things like that because that can entrap. Uh, every once in a while, we have somebody that's taking out the sea turtle stakes. And you see in this picture where I have those stakes, um, I, I took those pictures of those stakes marking the sea turtle nests. Here in the Treasure Coast area, they pretty much are only marking those nests in areas where they're doing research, some sort of beach renourishment, something like that. So please don't remove those stakes because it is uh, really important for people to, to monitor sea turtle nests on those beaches. So each person has a responsibility. So there are five sea turtles that are found in Florida, five species. We have loggerheads, we've got the green sea turtles, the leatherbacks. These three are the ones that nest in St. Lucie. And then also in Florida, we have the Kemp's Ridley and the Hawksbill, which I'm not really gonna touch on that. Um, but I'm, I'm going to talk about those first three. So the leatherback sea turtle, of course, is the largest sea turtle, and it's also the most endangered here in Florida. It's, it's, um, it's extremely rare, and when we find them on our beaches here in St. Lucie County, they are so large that it almost looks like heavy machinery has plowed through. It's almost like somebody took a backhoe and plowed through the sand and, uh, and has done some major beach, beach work out there. But you can see from this picture where that lady is standing in the background. Uh, the interesting thing about this, I, I, Joe Scarola sent this to me, and there's actually a video on the following slide of this same sea turtle. So I'm gonna show that to you in just a minute. So these leatherback sea turtles have the ability to dive pretty deep, and you can see 3,000 feet at the most. Uh, they also have the, about, the ability uh, to regulate their body temperature, which is unusual for reptiles. We know that most reptiles are cold-blooded. Their body temperature is based on their surrounding environment. Mammals, for example, have the ability to regulate body temperature. Well, the sea turtle is able to do that as well, this, this particular species, the leatherback. Uh, their average length is about five, or excuse me, six feet. They can weigh upwards of 1,500 pounds. See what I mean? They're huge. They are covered in a leathery skin on the top of their shell, and they have black with white and pink and blue spots on them. Now, one of the things that I find the most interesting about leatherbacks is they're the biggest sea turtle that we have, but they eat some of the simplest organisms out in the ocean. For example, they eat jellyfish. 
sometimes when I go around, I talk to people who live in homeowners associations along our coast, and sometimes people don't always understand why we have to take care of sea turtles. And sometimes I have to kind of bring it right back to them and say, how does the sea turtle, how does saving sea turtles actually benefit them, that the individual person that might be um, living on the beach or visiting the beach? Well, if you think of it like this, you or your grandkids could be going in the ocean and getting stung by jellyfish. The more of these sea turtles you have, the more likely they're gonna eat the jellyfish. So sometimes you have to use that circular logic to keep things going. Here's the video. It's just amazing to me how huge that sea turtle is. And the people in that video were doing the absolute right thing. They kept their distance from that log or the leatherback sea turtle. They stayed pretty far away from it. Of course, they took pictures of it, which of course is okay to do. And uh, they stayed behind its head. So it wasn't like the sea turtle thought that it was being blocked from the ocean. So uh, I just get excited whenever I see that video. It just reminds me of how magnificent these leatherback sea turtles are. Uh, the next largest is the green turtle. And these are largely vegetarians. They're named for their green body fat. That's how they get the name green sea turtle. Their average size is about 350 pounds. Their average length is about 3.3 feet. They have an olive brown uh, shell. Their, their carapace is olive brown and they have dark streaks and their plastron is yellow. So the underside has a little yellow tint to it. And then we have uh, the loggerheads, which are the most common uh, sea turtle in Florida. They average about 275 pounds, about three feet in length. They have a ruddy brown top and they're yellow underneath as well. They eat crustaceans and unfortunately, sometimes they do fall prey to sharks. And here in Florida, if you are down in the Palm Beach area, uh, Juno Beach, uh, they have the loggerhead museum down in, in Juneau Beach, where they actually rehabilitate sea turtles that are sometimes injured from shark injuries. And uh, it's just really interesting. If, you, if you're down that way, stop in, I recommend it. Now, some of the threats, uh, I took this picture on the beach. It was during sea turtle nesting season. Uh, entanglement is one of the big problems. And unfortunately, sometimes people leave furniture out. And when the furniture is left out, the sea turtles, of course, could get entangled, especially since many of them are coming out at night to nest. You see what this particular sea turtle did. It came out of the ocean and laid its nest and then went right back, but it had to go around that beach furniture. I've seen um, photos, and I'm sure Joe has, has actually got horror stories, where they can actually get entrapped in beach furniture and die. So just make sure that beach furniture is probably 
properly stowed and off the beaches during sea turtle nesting season. And of course, we're coming up on summertime and we've got 4th of July and Memorial Day and other things like that. This is kind of like the nightmare scenario where you have people heavily using the beaches and they're putting uh, tents and other structures up for sometimes days, if not a week or more. And you can see where they're putting it up right where sea turtles might be emerging out of their nests. So keep in mind that you don't wanna put these structures up, follow all your local codes, make sure that you're not doing anything to block sea turtles from nesting or block sea turtles from um, having their hatchlings actually emerge up out of the nest. They can fall prey to predators. On our beaches, raccoons can sniff out their nest. They'll smell the eggs and they'll eat the eggs. So one thing that people can do to kind of keep that raccoon problem in control is just pick up trash. Sometimes uh, raccoons will be attracted to a, a beach if there are a lot of people eating lunch and sometimes sandwiches get left and things like that. Just make sure you're packing out everything that you bring in. Sometimes we also have issues with coyotes. And this particular picture is a picture of coyotes that um, one coyote, that's a coyote print, it dug up a sea turtle nest and ate some of the eggs, probably almost all of them, and discarded all the egg shells. And of course the egg shells are soft. They're not, they're not hard like a chicken egg. Uh, dogs can also be an issue. Uh, here in St. Lucie County, we don't allow dogs on the beach. Uh, we've got one beach that does allow dogs on leashes. So uh, wh whatever municipality you're in, make sure you're following the appropriate code and keep in mind that you do wanna watch, watch your dogs, especially during nesting season, because they can dig up these nests. And unfortunately, sometimes people will go out and steal eggs. And it seems like once a year, or maybe a couple times a year, uh, we have people in Southeast Florida that are caught uh, stealing sea turtle net eggs. And, and what they do is they plain and simple eat them, which of course is against the law. And if you see anything like that happening, you call that Florida Fish and Wildlife hotline and you go ahead and, and turn them in. And so we have issues like that, but also these hatchlings, as they're down in the nest, they could be five or six feet down below the sand because the sand shifts on top of the beach. So the, the sea turtle might've laid a nest that was maybe a foot and a half deep to begin with, but as the season goes and over the weeks, the sand gets pushed up on the beach, it might be five or six feet down. Ghost crabs will actually hang out there and eat the hatchlings as they start to emerge up. So, you know, there's, you know, natural predation. And then of course, sharks, like we had already talked about. Plastic is another very serious issue. And my colleague, Maya McGuire, and all of my Sea Grant colleagues at the University of Florida, they have a very uh, active program dealing with marine microplastics. And they're finding plastic all over the place. So every sample, it seems like they, they, they look at has plastic. Now, if you think about it, if you've got a plastic bag in the ocean, it just doesn't disappear. It doesn't degrade. It just basically gets smaller and smaller and smaller until it gets difficult to measure. So I'm gonna show you this little video. It's short, it's only maybe 30 or 40 seconds long. And you can see the difference. Sea turtles would have a hard time figuring out that maybe the plastic bag is not a jellyfish. So that is a very serious threat. Of course, improper lighting is an issue and Joe Scarola with Ecological Associates, he's gonna talk about that more in depth. But you can see this, I believe that's a loggerhead sea turtle. He's looking right up in that condominium. And uh, we've got codes here in St. Lucie County that say that you're not supposed to see any lights and condos and high rises or any of the buildings if you're standing at the primary dune looking west. And of course, it would be different depending on whatever municipality or county you're in. But that sea turtle is looking right at that, that condo with the light. Sea turtles prefer dark beaches to nest. When they don't feel like it's dark enough, they'll go back into the water and they'll do this thing called a false crawl and then they'll come back out a little bit later on. So they're expending a lot of energy. Also, the hatchlings get re disoriented. They go the wrong way. They go towards the light instead of the ocean. 
So Joe is going to talk more about this a little bit later on. With nesting biology, the sea turtles that we have here in Florida nest mo mostly at night. You could go to places like Hawaii and they're out on the beaches in the middle of the daylight, you know, but here in Florida, they nest mostly at night. And that's probably due to the predators um, being able to find them more easily in the daytime. They're, they're more successful nesting at night. They'll lay about 100 plus ping pong ball size eggs. They might return several times in the season. There are some that nest every two years on like clockwork, and we'll see that in one of the charts in a minute. Now, one of the other interesting things about sea turtles is the temperature of the nest determines the gender of the young. So the hatchlings are more likely to be female the warmer the nest is. So if you get upwards of 87, 88 degrees, you're gonna start having that imbalance where you have more females emerging out of the nest rather than you know, having that 50-50 balance. And then of course, there's the issue with the false crawls. So sea turtle, the mamas will usually here in Florida come out at night, they'll seek out those really dark beaches and then she'll usually get up in the rack line, but sometimes she gets in the dunes. Sometimes they go right back, you know, behind the dunes and she'll lay her eggs, but sometimes she doesn't. Sometimes she doesn't feel like the conditions are quite right. Maybe it's not dark enough. Maybe there are too many people around. Maybe there's a raccoon out and she'll go back in the ocean and we, we call that a false crawl. So she might do that a couple of times before she feels comfortable enough to actually dig her nest and lay her eggs. And this, of course, is a hatchling, and you see the tracks. If you're fortunate enough in June, July, August, and September, right up until October, you'll probably see a lot of these, these tracks on the beaches. And usually what you'll notice is they come out of one area, one nest, and then they all hopefully go to the ocean. If the sea turtle hatchlings go the wrong way, instead of going out into the ocean, let's say they go back to the lights on the condos behind the dunes, well, what they do is they end up burning that yolk. The, the yolk in their stomach is their fuel. They'll burn their yolk and they might not have enough energy in their body to make it to safety out in the ocean. So here are the nesting trends in peninsular Florida for the leatherbacks. You can see this is for the entire peninsula. You can see in 2019 that we had a little, a little less than 350 nests in the entire state. These are the fewest nests that we have. And then we've got the greens, and you can see that cycle of, you know, every two years of nesting. In 2019, they had a high level of nesting, uh, whereas in 2018, the nesting dropped off. So hopefully, you know, this, you know, we'll see, well, we probably will see a little bit of a drop off, but Joe Scarola with Ecological Associates, he can talk a little bit more about what they're expecting on our beaches this year. And then the loggerheads, uh, they're the most common here in the Treasure Coast area. Uh, we have um, in, in the peninsular Florida, right around 50 or 65,000 nests. So I have some nesting data for St. Lucie County. You can get this for any county that you want here in Florida um, that has coastal you know, beaches. The loggerhead nests, we had 7,643 loggerhead nests that actually had the eggs laid. And then we had some loggerheads that came out, they were getting ready to lay their nest for whatever reason they went back in. And that was um, the non-nesting emergence, that was 9,388. With the greens, we had 1,257 nests laid. With the non-nesting emergencies for the greens, we had 2,035. And then our fewest, uh, the most, endangered that we have in St. Lucie County is the leatherback nest. We had 95 nests laid last year and 21 of them um, were non-nesting emergences where they came out of the water and then went back in without laying the, the eggs. So at this point, what I'm going to do, I'm going to unmute April. I'm going to unmute Joe. I'm going to mute myself and um, Joe and April, just let me know when you want me to go from one slide to the next, okay? Very good. All right. Um, thanks, Ken. That was super fascinating. And I'm, I'm going to turn things over to Joe Scarola here in just a sec. So Joe is a um, senior scientist with Ecological Associates, and he has a BS in biology from UCLA. 
Um, and he has really extensive experience with sea turtle research in some really cruddy places to work, like Cape Verde and Barbados and Western Australia. And then there's, you know, Georgia, Texas, and Florida, but still not too bad, really. Um, Joe actually specializes um, in sea turtle conservation and um, shorebird surveys. Um, he works a lot with beachfront lighting management, so he's going to talk to us a good bit about that today. Um, and he also does a lot of uh, data collection work with some really highly accurate um, GPS systems. So Joe, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, could you just tell us maybe a little bit more about you and the work that you do with Ecological Associates? Sure. Um, thanks, April. So um, at EAI, we kind of responsible for those early morning um, digital nesting surveys. And so you've probably seen us out there, you know, riding our ATVs right early morning at sunrise. And so what we're doing out there is we're looking for new crawls in the morning. And so if we do see a new nest, We'll mark off those, that nest with those stakes that Ken uh, showed earlier in the presentation. And then um, we only actually mark off a subsample of the nest on the beach, because like Ken said, we had over 7,000 nests on the beach. Um, if we were marking all of those nests, we would be out there a really long time. So um, there are nests out there that aren't marked. So again, you know, if you're out there on the beach, you know, be careful with your beach umbrellas, digging, stuff like that, because not all the nests on our beaches are actually marked. So uh, then once it comes time for those nests to actually hatch, um, we go in and we dig up those nests and we count the eggs and determine the reproductive success of that nest and for all the nests on our beaches. So um, we also do some nighttime work where I go out and do uh, nighttime lighting evaluations. And what I'm doing at night is you know, going out there and identifying all the lights uh, that I'm seeing from the beach that have a potential to be an issue for nesting and hatchling sea turtles. And what I do is I have a very accurate GPS. So I take a point on the beach where I'm standing where I see the actual um, light source. And then with that GPS, GPS, I can actually shoot a laser and get the actual GPS point of the actual light source. And so um, that's mailed out to all the property owners to kind of say, hey, um, this can be an issue for sea turtles. Um, would you mind you know, correcting this issue? And a lot of times some of these issues can be corrected with a simple shielding or you know, simple fixes on your property. That's fascinating. I'm I can't wait to learn a little bit more about the lighting issues, but um, can, how long really, I mean, I see you've been all over the place and you have a ton of experience with sea turtles. How long have you been doing this kind of work with sea turtles? So I've been doing working with sea turtles for about, um, 15 years, um, in Florida specifically with EAI, about eight years. And so it's been great. It's allowed me to travel all over the world and then see many different species. I've actually uh, worked with every species of sea turtle and there are seven different species. Um, but yeah. That's, do you have a favorite? Um, I do, but um, okay, I'll say it's the Kemp's <laughs> uh, uh, Just because they're the smallest, the rarest and um, they do the most elaborate kind of dance when they're covering their nest and I just think it's, it's one of the most amazing things to see. They kind of just do a little, the Kemp's wiggle I like to call it. <laughs> it's something to see. That's fabulous. Everybody has a favorite something. <laughs> I don't think you have to be ashamed of that. <laughs> so you've already told us, um, uh, I think, quite a bit about what you do during nesting season. Is there, is there anything else? Um, that you'd like folks to know about what you guys do during nesting season or about nesting season in particular? Uh, I think the biggest thing is, you know, Ken kind of touched on a little bit, but, you know, if you're out on the beaches, uh, Florida Oceanographic has kind of started this new, you know, uh, keep the beaches uh, dark, clean, and flat. And what that means is, you know, um, kind of leave the beaches the way you, you found them, if not better. So, if you're in your condos at night, you know, close your blinds at night, you know, turn off any unnecessary lights. Don't leave lighting on throughout the night. Um, you know, if you have all your lights on inside, you can't really see out into the ocean and everyone can see into your, your place. So, you know, you want to keep it nice and dark, you know, um, for the turtles, if not for yourself. You want to keep the beaches nice and flat, you know, fill in those holes. Um, we do get hatchings a lot where they emerge from the nest. 
and people have dug, dug a large pit and we're in the morning, we're collecting them out of those pits and trying to get them into the water. So, you know, smooth out those holes, you know, kind of flatten those sand castles. Because if you're a tiny little, little hatchling and you're trying to make your way to the water and this big, huge, giant sand castles in your way, you know, you're, you're spending extra energy trying to go around that. The more you're on, the, the longer you're on the beach, the more likely you're going to be taken by a predator. So we want to, you know, you know, minimize their effort, effort for them to get into the water. And then the last thing is, you know, keeping the beaches clean. Um, you know, if whatever you bring on the beach, make sure you're bringing it off the beach. That includes beach furniture, trash. And if you see trash that other people have left, you know, go ahead and clean that up. So, you know, that's going to end up in the water. And not only sea turtles digestive systems, but other like marine mammals and other, you know, organisms out there. Fantastic. Thank you so much. So, how, I mean, how serious is this problem with um, improper lighting for like hatchling disorientation? Does it mostly affect hatchlings? Is it also an issue for the adults? How serious is the problem? So it, it can be quite a serious issue. Um, so the way that the hatchlings find the water is they go towards the brightest horizon. And normally that's the moon and the stars reflecting off the ocean. So when you start to introduce a lot more artificial light sources, that can actually bring the hatchlings, you know, towards the dunes, and they can end up in roads and then eventually be run over by cars. So that's what we want to avoid. Um, for, the, for the adult nesting females, though, um, if there is a brightly lit beach, those females actually tend to avoid those brightly lit areas. So um, we do see um, evidence showing that they'll go to darker stretches of the beach, but if their habitat starts to degrade in, in some of those other areas and less nesting um, habitat is available for them, you know, that can be also an issue for these nesting females trying to find a great location to nest. So that makes a lot of sense. So I'm wondering, have you noticed uh, over time, I know there are now codes and that sort of thing that um, uh, tell us what we're allowed to do with regard to lighting um, around nesting areas in some places. Some places don't have as stringent to codes. Have you noticed really that there is a uh, more of an increase in awareness about um, lighting issues for sea turtles? And then maybe you could touch on that need for codes to help address those issues. Yeah, definitely. I mean, definitely here in St. Lucie County, they are um, really involved in the whole process. We have a working group that meets, you know, a couple of times a year to kind of go over the issues that we have in St. Lucie County. And they're, they're really addressing the problem here. And, and it really shows because we have some of the lowest disorientation rates in the entire state of Florida here in St. Lucie County, which is, which is great. Um, so we have seen, you know, a decrease in disorientations um, percentage-wise year after year, you know, since we've kind of implemented this program. And um, we are really seeing a difference, difference out there. Hey, Joe, you have um, a slide on the lighting fixtures. Did you want me to share that screen right now? Yeah, sure. Let's, let's put that up right now. So here's kind of an example of, of what is, is a good, good, good example and a bad example of what we're looking for. And so, um, we're not really saying you need to turn off all your lights, make everything dark, because you know, um, we really want you guys to be safe on your property, but there are ways to actually, you know, shield and use um, different type bulbs that will, you know, provide adequate safety and security for your property, but also won't be an issue for nesting um, and hatchling sea turtles. So, um, you, FWC and the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service have a list of uh, wildlife certified fixtures, um, and you can check them out on this website um, at MyFWC, the bottom two websites, and uh, you know, write that down. And you know, they have a bunch of fixtures that are, are approved. You can see on, on the left right there, there's a bad example of an unshielded bulb where light is just being broadcast all over the place. And then a good example of a light where the light is actually directed down to where it needs to be on the ground. Um, and the whole fixture shielding is actually using a long wavelength bulb. And that long wavelength, wavelength bulb um, is actually less, you know, detrimental to uh, nesting, nesting and hatchling sea turtles. And while it's not invisible to them, it does actually kind of reduce um, the glow and everything going on and uh, reduces disorientation when, when used appropriately. I also have one more slide if you want to move on to that one, Ken. 
And so here's kind of an example of how, you know, lighting is not only an issue for sea turtles, but it can also be an issue for, you know, human safety as well. And so here you can see a, a big floodlight on this property. You can see light going everywhere. It's creating a glare in your eyes, kind of like when you're driving and headlights are going through your face. And so everyone has that kind of this misconception that I need the brightest light and just have it, you know, blasting everywhere. But if you look at this photo, you can see this just light coming glaring right into your eyes. Now, if you go to the next slide, so by shielding it, you can actually realize that there's someone standing right in the shadows and that glare is not allowing you to actually see this person that's, person that's been lurking in the shadow. So here's an example of how, you know, proper shielding of lighting on your property can actually, you know, enhance, you know, safety and security on that property. That's fantastic. Um, th thank you so much, Joe. We so appreciate you uh, coming to share this information with us. And um, I don't know if you have any closing remarks, but I think that um, can we might be ready for some questions as well. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we have just a few more slides here. Um, thank you, April and Joe. As always, it's a pleasure working with both of you. And um, we do have some UF IFAS resources that are available. There's a book for um, kids. So I would recommend this if you have um, kids, probably, you know, middle school and, and younger. And uh, the University of Florida IFAS bookstore has this available for you. Now, all these slides will be available. I'm gonna send out a link later that's gonna have um, this uploaded to YouTube. So you'll be able to watch this whole video all over again. We also have sea turtle nesting posters. So let's say that you're working um, in a condo, let's say you're doing ground maintenance, or let's say you live in a condo on the beach and you have a central lobby or maybe you've got some um, elevators or something, you can purchase these, these posters and put them in there to kind of remind people how they can live with sea turtles in and have sea turtle friendly beaches. Simple things like mining your pets. Um, leaving these sea turtle nests alone, artificial light, um, you know, modifications like Joe had mentioned, taking down sandcastles and filling in holes and just putting your stuff away. Just little reminders. And uh, that book that I mentioned earlier has a little plushy doll with it too. So I don't know, it's cute, it's cute. And then we do have some uh, EDIS publications that are available, uh, 10 ways you can help and then uh, there's priorities for environmental education efforts. So these are available through the University of Florida IFAS Bookstore. So I think what we can do at this time, um, April, uh, April, Joe and I are unmuted and I'm gonna stop sharing. And if people, let's see, Joe, you're unmuted. So if people have questions, they can go to the chat function and they can ask, ask us questions and um, either Joe, April or I will go ahead and, and respond to any questions you might have. April, did you want to take lead on that? And if you um, see any chats come up? Yeah, absolutely. Um, we're, we're, we're here to answer any of your questions. So um, please feel free to chime in. Um, I do see somebody had asked a question initially about what turtles we were going to learn about, but I think probably they figured that out by now. <laughs> All right, so, yeah, so what's sea turtle? Oh, here, uh, here go. we go. So here is um, Mary Catherine asking, is it possible to see a sea turtle um, hatching or walking into the ocean? So when you go to the beach. I have seen this personally. Uh, I've been out on um, Fort Pierce Inlet State Recreation Area in broad daylight, and I've had nests emerge right out in front of me. Um, of course, I make sure that I'm not impeding them. You shouldn't block them. You shouldn't pick them up. You should stay well behind the nest. Um, Joe, do you have anything you want to mention about that? Um, yeah, so it's pretty rare for it to happen during the daytime. Um, it does tend to happen during uh, cloudy and rainy days because the cue for the turtles to come out um, is when the sand kind of cools down. So when you have a rainy or a cloudy day, the sand's kind of cooler and they all kind of push out together but it is pretty rare to see it during the daytime. Um, a lot of times if it's in the middle of the daytime, they can actually come out and it's a really hot day and cry. So that's not a, 
advantageous uh, strategy for them to do. So a lot of that stuff actually happens at nighttime um, when the sand cools and um, they're able to actually get out under cover of darkness. And they're less likely to be eaten by a predator uh, when it's dark out as well. Excellent. So I see um, Nancy is wondering if uh, we can tell her which turtles nest when during the year. Well, right now we are in sea turtle nesting season. Uh, I can talk about here in St. Lucie County, it does shift a little bit as you go up and down the coast of Florida. Uh, so, you know, what works for us here in this county might not necessarily work up in the Panhandle. But pretty much from March 1st through November 15th, that's when we can expect sea turtles to be nesting on our beaches and for the hatchlings to be coming out. Uh, they usually are in largest numbers in the middle of the summer, uh, June, July, August, September. And of course, we recommend that people don't go out looking for them, don't go out with your flashlights. If you wanna see them, you're better off going to some place like the Loggerhead Center down in Juneau, or maybe FPNL's Energy Encounter, where they do sea turtle walks, or um, going, I know Disney up in Vero Beach, they have nighttime Disney walks. So you're better off um, hooking up with an organization that has the permits. Um, Ecological Associates has started doing a few of them. So uh, you do not want to go out on your own looking for them. I think that um, there are a number of organizations in this area, Ken, in addition to the ones you mentioned, like Hope Sound Nature Center and some other places like that that do turtle walks as well. So, um, so I see that um, Anne is asking um, if we could, uh, if you might be able to talk to us a little bit more about how the leatherback turtle regulates body temperature. I think I'm going to leave that to Joe because I'm not exactly <laughs> sure. They don't sweat. Maybe their muscles contract. I'm not sure. Uh, All I, don't blood flow. I don't have an answer for that either, Ken. <laughs> okay. <Yeah. laughs> like, like mammals, if you think about mammals, uh, we have the ability because we can regulate our body temperature. Uh, we have the ability to sweat, dogs pant, um, we can shiver, uh, but as far as the leatherbacks, I, I honestly don't know. We'll have to do a little more reading. Yep. Um, so let's see, what else do we, so, oh, here's a really good question from Isabel, wondering, um, is there some place she can go to actually find the proper shaded lights for use on her property? Yes. Um, if you want to put that slide back up. Yeah, I'll, let me go back to that. Go to that website. FWC has a bunch of certified pictures you can, you can buy. Um, and then in the Muni, in the code in your, or whatever your, whatever county you're in, there should be um, something about um, what requirements are, are needed in, in your county. But in general, they'll give you on those two websites, um, there's a list of, of actual products and, um, and, and installation instructions for these, these type of fixtures and where they can be placed so that they're um, you know, meeting code requirements. I will be sending everybody the link. Um, you've got these two links down below uh, with the lighting you know, information. I will be sending everybody a website that has, it'll be a blog that has all the stuff embedded in it. So you will be getting this. And so also in the bottom corner right there, um, some of these products have this wildlife certified stamp on those products. And that's how um, you would know if, if that bulb or fixture has been you know, wildlife certified. And it should come with a certification number. Um, a little disclaimer, um, there are some companies that have been just placing this on their products and they're not actually certified. So make sure they have a certification number uh, with that stamp uh, going on. I think it also, um, we should probably point out, uh, Joe, you're probably hopefully going to agree with this. Education is number one right now. You know, we, Joe can go out and do all the surveys, but if the people who are receiving the information about improper lighting, if they don't really understand it, or let's say that they um, resent being asked to modify their lighting, uh, that's not necessarily helping the situation out. So, Education goes hand in hand with, with this whole lighting regime. Um, we have to teach people uh, why it's necessary. And I just stopped that sh screen share. <laughs> so we, um, we have a couple of questions that I think somebody might be able to run together. So um, Trish is wondering if there are any um, 
turtles that nest in this area that might have tracking devices on them or or anything like that and then perhaps when somebody's answering that they might be able to remind us how many species of turtles there are all together and maybe just a reminder how many nest here as well. Hey Joe you want to go and I don't know if you've ever seen a sea turtle with the tracking unit on it come up and nest. Yeah in this area the only ones they're doing is Leatherbacks, Florida Leatherbacks Incorporated. They, they are doing a nighttime tagging and they'll put satellite tags on Leatherbacks in Martin County. Um, but that's the only uh, group in this area that is doing satellite tracking. Um, there are a few groups doing uh, you know, flipper and pit tags, but those don't actually track the turtles in real time. Uh, it's just Leatherbacks and it's more of like a harness that goes on the back of the Leatherbacks and when they come up to breathe air, it sends a, a signal up to a satellite, and that's how we can track uh, leatherbacks in this area. So yeah, if you want information on tracking, go to Florida Leatherbacks um, and look for their group page. Yeah, they're in Martin County. And then can you remind us how many species of turtle, sea turtles are there in the world and, and how many of them nest here in this area? So we have seven in the world, um, eight if you count, the black turtle has a different species, but we, we consider it a, a subspecies and that's found in Hawaii in the Pacific. Um, but so we have the loggerhead, the green, and the leatherback that nest here in Florida. We get an occasional Kemp's Ridley, maybe one or two in the entire state a year, maybe one hawksbill or two in the entire state every every year. If if that, some years we have no hospitals nesting in the entire state of Florida. And then we have the Olive Ridley, which um, has airy bottom nesting in Costa Rica. We have the Kemp's Ridley, which is nests solely on a beach um, down in Mexico. Um, there is a subpopulation in Texas, Texas that's also nesting. And then we have the Australian flatback, which is only found in Australia. Cool. So we see that um, Rhonda is asking also about um, uh, index nesting beaches. She says she lives on North Hutchinson Island uh, and they don't mark nests in her area at all except to run over the turtle tracks with their ATVs. So can, is, can you explain to us a little bit about index nesting beaches? Um, so basically they're, they're not marking any, there's no nourishment project, there's there aren't marking anything to determine the reproductive success on the on the state park side of the beach. So they're still monitoring it. Um, so they'll go, go out go out with a GPS. They'll take a GPS point, whether it's a false crawl or a nest. And so they're still counting all the crawls. They're just not marking them to dig them up. So they're still out there. They're just not digging them up. Um, and that probably has to do with funding more than anything. Well, there's that. And also, um, when you put the marking up, the stakes up, um, it's almost like saying dig here. <laughs> um, raccoons, you know, people, um, they'll get cued into the fact that there's a seashore nest like right there. So they do it where they're doing research or um, monitoring the beach for um, rain nourishment. Okay. Cool. Well, if, we, if anybody has any other questions, get them in quick. Ah, it looks like we're all done. <laughs> yeah. Well, April, I just want to thank you for being our host today. And Joe, of course, as always, thank you both. Oh, I have, I have, I have one question I want to answer, actually. Is that okay? So Margaret asked about other circumstances where organizations ah. or people would be exempt, you know, from lighting regulations. Um, so that's not the case. There are, are different rules for if you're, you know, installing uh, new fixtures where they have to be, you know, a turtle friendly um, certified fixture. Um, but if you have existing fixtures, uh, you may not necessarily have to uh, replace them with a turtle friendly fixture, but you have to go out and actually shield or do something so that light is not visible from the beach. And I think also it's important to, to state that the reason they have county codes is so that it, and state codes, state laws and regulations, is so it doesn't automatically become a federal offense every, of the Endangered Species Act every time a sea turtle gets disoriented from lighting. So 
you know, it's, it's wise to have these codes and to know what they are and, and to abide by those rules. So I think we've got one more little quick easy one. So uh, Nancy's asking in St. Lucie County, it, kind of what order sea turtles nest in? So do they nest at different times of year? I'm imagining is what she's wondering. Well, I think Joe would probably agree the the leatherbacks are the early nesters. Yep. So we have leatherbacks. Normally they start coming in March, but this year they came in February. So we don't know what the heck's going on this year. Uh, you know, we had a nest February 6th this year, which is the earliest in the state ever. Um, that, that was actually in Martin County, just a little south of, of the border in Tennessee County. Um, we have other backs come first. Loggerheads start to come, uh, you know, April, May. And then greens start to come in end of May, beginning of June. So we have those leatherbacks, loggerheads, and then greens start coming. And we've had greens nest all the way into November. So, and then that nest hatched in January. So we're close to having year-round nesting here in St. Lucie County. Well, great. Um, I think we're all set. I, it looks like we've got uh, it looks like we're pretty much finished with the questions. April, would you agree? Joe, would you agree? Yep. That looks like it. So, um, April, did you want to wrap it up, or do you want me to go ahead? Just uh, all I really want to do is thank everybody for um, joining us today. It's been and thanks to Ken and Joe for all of this fantastic information. Um, I think we've all really learned a lot about sea turtles and nesting in this area and how important it is to be aware of the lighting issues. Uh, I I'm kind of just want to note really quick that I see that Trish uh, made a note that uh, as sea turtle nesting season is kind of ending, manatee season begins. So we always have something fun to look for in this area. We all love manatees, don't we? Yes, we do. <laughs> Okay. Well, I, once again, I want to thank everybody for joining us today. April, it's always um, wonderful working with you. Joe, of course, you know, you and I have done quite a bit of work over the years. Uh, we will go ahead and get an email out to you. We're going to ask you to please complete a short survey just to let us know what you thought about the program today and uh, how much you might have learned about sea turtles. And then uh, as part of that process, uh, you will be directed to the blog, which will have a copy of this video on it. So um, thank you very much. And uh, thanks, everybody. And I'm going to go ahead and close the, the room down. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.